Welcome back to lightning round of show 11 of Hipmojo. We're going to talk first about an article that WordPress founder Matt Mullenweg wrote. Little side note, he lives in Montreal. Does he now? In the summer, at least. One time I was at this common friend's birthday party, and I looked, and I'm like, I'm like, man, that guy looks like the founder of WordPress. And then just later on, I searched, and I was like, maybe he is in Montreal. He I, lives here for the jazz fest. He's like completely he, addicted to it. Okay, I thought it was just for the overall summer joie de vivre. Okay, it's very They actually timed Montreal WordCamp with jazz fest to make sure that he would come and speak. Interesting. Okay, good stuff. So he wrote an article, fascinating, about what's next for Apple. Lots of good points. He talks about maps, search. search, also cars. Yes, cars. Well, well, what did you think about that? I mean, I want to focus on cars, but you could... Well, is he right or is he... His biggest thing was that, um, you know, cars are trying to get a little bit more smart, but there's two problems with it. One, that the user interfaces on, the, on, on this technology, as he said, makes his eyes bleed. Yeah. Uh, and the other was the price point. He's like, um, you buy, for, there was one example, a Tesla Roadster, you can get some Alpine system installed for 4,500, but that's literally like four times the price as if you just go to the store, buy the Alpine system yourself and install it. So the other thing was price point. But, it, but his whole point was that the, the experience of these smart cars completely sucks. And he thinks Apple would actually have the potential to compete there. And he ends the, the, the blog post with a quote by uh, Alan Kay, and, that's it, and it says, people who are really serious about software should make their own hardware, to which Matt adds, people who make hardware should get their software act together before Apple does it for them. So I, I, I yeah. think... I think the world, you know, we talk about mobile, and mobile is not just your handheld device. I think it's consumers on the go. And when are you most on the go? In your car. car. So I see the same way that Google is, I mean, Henry Blodgett of Business Insider, who, whom I love, is like, why the hell is Google spending all this money on this humanless cars? It must make sense, because if you spend three hours going to and from work, you're not being productive. So if you could be in a car and at that time work, spend more time online, click on more Google ads, it, it is beneficial to Google. It takes a bit of a leap to get there. So I just think Apple and Google are going to be clashing on everything, including cars. Whether or not it's in the next two years or ten years is not that crazy. Now, I do think, though, that Apple will never invest a big chunk of, I mean, they have $80 billion of cash. By next year, they'll have $170 billion. They could buy GM or Ford, but they won't. Those companies have pension plans. It's just, it's not going to go. But they could actually invest or buy a company like Tesla. That's the thing. They could totally do something like that and get a faster gateway into, let's say, the next generation of cars. Or they could, it sounds crazy, they could also just subsidize in, in many ways. I mean, that company's going to have so much cash that... Well, I could also see limit. them doing something like, for example, when the iPhone first came out in the U.S., you could only get it through AT&T, so yeah. they might do some type of strategic partnership with a company that's fledgling, like Chrysler, and uh, may help them make their cars super sexy, do that for a few years, generate a lot of buzz and awareness around the kind of technology and products they can produce, and then just open it up to everybody. Oh, yeah, we'll move on to the next one, but that's not crazy, that the next time that the big car makers are going to need an injection of cash, it very well could not be the government government, but it would be a company. And it, the same way that Microsoft is in bed with Ford with their Sync product, we have a bunch of videos that we did with them when we were at the Detroit show, it's not crazy to think that Apple and Google with their balance sheets are going to start going into there. Okay, next point. All right, so um, in the last week uh, there was a list published online, top 100 online video companies. Um, I want to know what your thoughts are about the picks or how it was done, but I'm, I'm also curious to know how you feel about Watch Mojo not making the list. Okay, well, to be fair, going into it, I was like, oh, we'll probably make it, because I was like, 100 video companies, even if they pick 10 content companies and the 90 others are tech and ads, how could we not be there? When I looked at the list, I, I mean, you see companies like Microsoft and Apple, so Ma Adobe, you know, so massive tech companies. It was really... A list is great, more power. First off, congratulations to the 100 companies that made it. That should be what I started off with. It was disappointing for a second until I saw who the companies were. There was really only one other company that touches on content, and that's Revision 3. And I think Revision 3, Jim Lauderback and his team, congratulations. They deserve it. Although they're not really doing as much pure production as they used to. So I looked at it as, okay, basically the closest thing to content was aggregators as Blip. And these are all companies that are very deserving. I think we are and will continue to be for a while the Rodney Dangerfield of online video where we get no respect. Oh, that's even though, terrible, Rodney Dangerfield? Well, I mean, the no respect part. A few reasons, I think, stem from one, you know, we don't have a, a, a big VC that spent, you know, $20 million in us and, and we sort of leverage that to get news. And because of that, we don't spend millions of dollars advertising at things like this. And, you know, one of the commenters on streaming media said, well, this is basically a list of your advertisers. And I think that's unfair. These are basically 100 big companies that are doing a lot in video not at all hurt or offended. What I am going to do is I'm going to be working on a list of maybe not 100, but the top 10, the top 20, the top 30, the top 50 
content video companies that matter or you should keep an eye on, um, just to sort of put a spotlight on content companies that are doing great things but oftentimes get overlooked. But not at all hurt. I was going to toy with doing a press release saying, you know, watch Mojo, not on the top 100. And then, you know, finish it off with saying, but maybe, you know, we could take comfort in knowing that we were ranked 101, or maybe not. But it's fine. And I'm actually, I shouldn't say anything bad. I'm speaking, I'm moderating a panel at Streaming Media West. And on the panel, there's going to be a dude from South Park, a guy from Comscore, Fox. So they were kind enough to invite me to do that. I guess it's a good consolation prize. I still would have done the press release and sent it to them, actually. Uh, yeah, right, I don't want to talk about press releases that you send out without making sure everybody approves them. But that's a whole other point. And, and Lesson we'll talk at a later date. Um, next point. All right, so uh, last week the Wall Street Journal had an article on how uh, web startups are hitting a bit of a cash crunch. Um, what do you think? Do you think this is accurate, true, false? Um, it's, not, it's less important what I think to start off the discussion. It's more important what people like Fred Wilson think, you know, one of the most successful VCs out there. I think the, the main takeaway is oftentimes when these great smart journalists and reporters write these stories, they have an angle and then they work back. Sorry, they have a conclusion they want to reach and then they work backwards to get a nice headline. I think what the Wall Street Journal article probably was more about was the big buzz and the big trend of angel investing. So angels basically became small VCs and VCs have morphed into these private equity firms. I think the bigger issue is that the angel sort of bubble has burst and whereas back in the day an angel round was raising two hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars on a valuation of two to three million, that angel round moved to become a $3 million raise on a seven pre-money, which was basically your Series A. So I think a lot of investors have been pouring money into these companies, the crapsters of the world, some of which are great, but most of them are like the next buzz. So remember, it's like you've seen them all, file sharing sites, location-based services, link shorteners, um, daily deals. You know, fad after fad, what I call the crapster, which is now probably craply, you know, just, uh, just throw money at it, hope that it sticks and it becomes big. I think those investors, those angels have been burnt. With the economy being what it is and real estate being what it is, a lot of them are like, wait a second, the stock market's not moving, my real estate is going down. Um, why am I putting these money into these companies that are cookie cutter and disappear? The angels are backing out. So some of the, a lot of the startups do have angels who funded them. And that's what they're feeling. I think VCs are fine. VCs, you know, I think the, the, the word is out. It's not a secret. VCs have a horrible track record. They throw money at everything. Some of them are going to be home runs. If they went for more singles and doubles and triples instead of grand slams, it would probably be a lot better. But it's a sort of ego and mindset that, look, we come, we're big risk takers when really they're not. And, and you know, yes, there is a sort of settling, you know, there is a bubbling burst. Uh, sorry, there is a bubble bursting, whether it's the VCs, whether it's the angels, I think it's more the angels you know, scaling back. Good companies will find a way to, to go on. Next point, set, you're, you're a father. I am a father, yes. I have two kids as well. I love Sesame Street being on YouTube. I mean, they're I'll great. Just, they're they great. do video amazing. They do video very well, and I love that they're, they're so progressive to be on YouTube. Their site needs Flash, so on the iPad, I, I just check them out on YouTube for my daughters. Their account was hacked this week. Yes. And what do you think of that? I mean, is it funny? Is it sad? What, what the hell? Ha is, is nothing sacred anymore? Um, I don't know. I, th I think there's two questions we have to ask. Um, exactly how was it hacked and what was the hacker's purpose? Um, a few years ago, uh, one of the big like uh, hacker troll circles hacked... Um, the website for uh, an organization that deals with epileptics, and what they did was they replaced the homepage with a whole bunch of flashing GIFs, right? So caused off a bunch of seizures, but what they were trying to do was show how unsecure the web was, you know, that, well, that's what they claimed that they were trying to do. Um, so there was a little bit of a message there, as unpolitically correct as it was. Um, also, on the, on, the, on the Sesame Street front, it depends what they're trying to do. They did replace all the videos with porn. So not very cool. And it's funny, last night of all nights, my daughter, I was trying to put her to bed and she likes to watch, a few, you know, read books or watch a few things. And usually I might pop in a DVD. But for whatever reason, last night, for the first time in a while, I was like, listen, let's just take out the iPad. Let's go on Sesame Street. And it's true. For a while there, I couldn't, when I would click more from Sesame Street, there was nothing. And I want to give credit to YouTube. They found out. And within 20 minutes, they pulled down the porn. Tragic story right there. They pulled down the porn and they basically, you know, fixed up the mess. 
Okay, my takeaway, funny or not, or what's the message is, I just hope that a company like Sesame Street, which is like, takes a leap of faith to be on a site like YouTube, which is great, it's great for, I think, the broader ecosystem, I hope it doesn't sort of like, make a lot of other companies think twice about being on YouTube, because in the end, you know, if, if Google is that unsecure, I mean, maybe somebody gets the password, I don't think it even has well, it could be something YouTube. as simple as, you know, a computer at Sesame Street had a virus on it that was keyword logging, and like, some hackers like, oh my god, I have I think Sesame it was Street's Elmo, I think Elmo, okay. Email of the week. Um, email of the week. Uh, John from Cincinnati writes. Um, Bengals. Pardon? So nothing. Bengals. Ash, uh, you write a lot all over the place. What does it actually get you? It's a very fair point. Uh, okay, you got to bear in mind the same way that sometimes you'll have a company CEO who's like a programmer and he can code like a mofo. I'm not that guy. I do content. I write a lot. So, you know, at my old company, I used to write 12 articles in a 14 week cycle. That's a lot. But I also was executive and I did my job. What you have to bear in mind is now with the media posts and TechCrunch, these are all themes and articles I've covered for a few years. Like, so when I do the top 10 M&A, that's really an article that I just updated. I did most of the research like in 2006 when the team was building the company and the content and I was sort of not that busy. Right now, it takes me like an hour to pump out these, video, these articles. I'm, you know, yes, I do have sometimes contracts to read to that I don't feel like getting to, but it's the same way that like, you'll have a, a company a CEO or CTO who still likes to roll up his sleeves and code, or you know, you'll have like, you know, whatever, somebody who's interested in, in something else at a company and that's his thing. For me, I'm a content guy, I run a content company, but I will say this, I was watching Steve Jobs' commencement speech last week and he said something about you can't connect the dots looking ahead. You can only connect the dots looking back. And I think that's sort of, when I was writing, crazy four or five posts, deep and analytical stuff on our blog in 06, 07, 08, I didn't really know why I was doing it. You know, it was interesting, I was learning a lot, it was good, I thought, to, to get our name out there and, and to build up like my expertise. I didn't really realize, but that's what's really helped me now pump out a, week, uh, a weekly article for both Media Post and TechCrunch, and that does help. Last night, uh, I'll be very candid, I won't name the gentleman's name, for about a year now, one of our advisors and I, we've been trying to establish a dialogue with a gentleman that's ran two of the biggest media companies of the last decade. I can't just email him on LinkedIn, this is a big cheese, so to speak. So we were always like, okay, we'll find a way, we'll find a way. He reads the article, he posts it on his Facebook page, and then my advisor knows them through Facebook, so he's like, oh my God, this guy posted your thing. He tweets it, we start having a short exchange. It's a lot easier now, you've established credibility, to say, hey, thanks for the kind words. So, so it's mostly so it's, an exercise in personal branding. I don't know if it's personal branding. I think, we, we talked about this sooner, we didn't raise 10 million in VC, so we couldn't spend anything in marketing. So it's our marketing strategy, which is heavy now on PR, and, and let's say, you know, whether it's, it's not so much personal branding, it's just branding. You know? You know, there's a lot of people that, that watch our videos, but a lot of the industry people, they don't watch videos because they're writing about it. So to go back to our second installment, as a marketer, you're also becoming a content producer. Well, yeah, but our, at our core, we're a media company. I think since we started doing the show and since I started writing heavily, it's al almost like the first time I actually feel like I'm running a media company. Because before, I was coming up with ideas, but I was a bit detached. This is sort of like connecting the dots, bringing it full circle. All right. We end on a deep point. So we're going to take, that's it. We're not taking a break. We're going to take a, a week-long break, and we'll see you same time, same place. Follow us, Hip Mojo on Twitter, Watch Mojo on Twitter, Gypsy Bandito. Gypsy Bandito, at Ashcan. Yeah, at Ashcan. That's it. That's all. See you next week, guys.